perennials in the fall uh, or leaving them up? I guess it would really depend on the perennial. Um, I do minimal cutting of my perennials. Most of my perennials that I have are perennial vegetable or fruit plantings. Um, we have a little bit of some perennial ornamentals like hostas or things like that. I don't do much cutting away of things like that. Uh, unless I need to prune or remove things, I would say that if I had an asparagus patch, which I don't, that after that frond and foliage died, I would probably cut that out just in case that was going to be a habitat for any pests. Um, but I do practice sanitation, so I would remove any disease materials or, or anything like that. So um, I've started the recording, so Tracy, whenever you're ready to go. All righty, thank you all for joining us today uh, to hear this great presentation on uh, part of the Can You Dig It series, Planting the Fall Garden Virtual Class Event. Uh, this is a partnership between the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Science and University Libraries. Um, we would like to also remind you all that we have librarians that's teleworking and if any of your students or yourself need any assistance with research, uh, please feel free to reach out to us librarians. That's what we're here for. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'll introduce Timothy McDermott. So Tim, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Tracy, and thank you so much, Jane. We're going to be talking about planting the fall garden today, and I'm really excited about this topic. And I want to first off thank uh, any of our repeat viewers. This is the third of three already scheduled classes, and in our last class, we used a poll question to pick what the topic would be for this class. And I'm really happy that you all picked planting the fall garden because my favorite topics to teach about are a lot of the topics that are a little bit less typical because I really like to engage um, folks with some of the ways that you can really maximize your production. And growing in the fall it is one way you can do that because what I like to say is Ohio is a four season growing environment. Uh, we do have some challenges both in the cold months and quite honestly in the really hot months. But the nice thing is there are some technologies. Uh, if you make great varietal picks, you, you don't have to do a lot in order to get production all year long. And in fact, my goal every year is I want to harvest and eat something fresh that I grew outside every single month out of the year. And I'm almost always successful with that. So. In our, we talk about our gardening seasons and we have sort of a traditional thing. In winter, you can grow over the winter with season extension. Not everything. You're not growing basil or eggplant outside, but things like spinach or things like kale um, or, or some of the root crops that you can protect um, and things in the onion family. Believe it or not, if you do a good job and you make wise varietal choices, you can grow them over winter. And then we have our traditional sort of spring and summer where a lot of planting goes on. And, um, and then we're talking about fall. Fall is a great season for growing and it's really underutilized because it comes at the tail end of the spring and the summer growing season. And some Summers where you have things like bugs and weeds and diseases. So a lot of times, myself included, I'm just not really excited about growing deep into fall because I'm sick of getting bit by mosquitoes and sick of weeding. But the great thing about fall is what happens is the temperatures start to moderate, the bugs start to go away, the rain comes back, but you still have a good amount of sunlight. And so I like growing in fall and hopefully this will, this will engage you and, and get you excited about maybe trying a little bit of some fall growing. As we've talked about um, throughout this gardening series, it's very important to plan at least one season ahead, right? So we're at the end of spring and we're heading into summer. I'm already thinking about what I'm gonna grow in fall. And the reason I do that is I want to maximize production. We're also going to talk about best varieties to grow and we always want to keep in mind our crop rotation because we want to use that tool in our toolbox to decrease the pest, weeds, and diseases that encountered in the garden.
So what other things can you do in fall besides the fact it's an outstanding growing season? Um, I grow, uh, I try to grow things that you wouldn't think of in the fall, quite honestly. And I'm planning through my management how I'm going to place and grow for my overwintered vegetable plantings. If I don't wanna grow in the fall, I'm gonna make the choice to try to keep that ground covered with plants though. So I'm thinking about when my cover crops are gonna go in. Cover crops are a great tool in your toolbox. And then I'm always using my integrated pest management. And that is things like cleaning up. If you have had a summer gardening season and maybe you got some tomato blight or maybe you had some other problems with with weeds, you want to get those out of there. You don't want to leave the seeds in there. You want to make sure the diseased material, that is all garbage, that is not compost. The work that you do for this year will impact next year. I talk about this when I talk about perennials. Next year's harvest is this year's management. This year's harvest is last year's management. So make sure that you have management as part of that. And then I get a lot of questions about bringing plants in over winter, winter under lights. Personally, I don't do that at all. The reason I don't do that is I, I do a tremendous amount of seed starting of vegetable and fruit and herb seeds that are gonna go out in my garden. And so I think of my grow area as like a nursery. I don't want to bring any older material that might bring in disease, that might bring in bugs. Uh, so I don't bring anything in and put it under lights personally. In fact, I like to have a period of time where I have nothing growing. Um, I'm almost at that time right now in my grow light stations where I have a couple last little things, some basil to go out and some cucumbers to go out. And then I'm gonna turn the lights off, sterilize the area and, um, and let it go fallow for a little bit to break any disease cycle. And then like we talked about in the very first class, you need to be recording your data and it doesn't have to be hard. You don't gotta keep a journal, but take a bunch of pictures and note what's been working and what's been not working so far. We've had a really interesting year so far, quite honestly. So I referenced seed starting. Um, I use seed starting, I, I consider it one of, if not my most important tool to maximize production. We're not gonna get into that today. What we were talking about before everybody go, got into the room was, do we need to revisit seed starting? We didn't do that class this year in, in our partnership series. Um, like we did in the past. And seed starting is a very popular class that we normally do in the spring. And what I'm planning, and I've been talking with Jane and Tracy about, is maybe a July 29th seed starting class. So if you think that that would be something you'd be interested in, uh, chime in on the chat box uh, and let us know if that would be something that'd be good to be talking about. Because the thing is, you're gonna wanna put seeds in the ground in fall, but nurseries aren't usually selling the stuff that you want in fall. You want to put in cauliflower, you want to put in broccoli, you, you want to put a bunch of um, Asian cabbages in, you want to put a bunch of lettuce in. A lot of the things that you would normally easily find at, at a nursery in spring that grow great in fall, if you can't grow them yourself, you, you might not find that you um, have that. On Growing Franklin, I have all of the various seed starting classes. I got a whole webinar done. I got a really cool interactive video. Um, but if we want to have a class, uh, save the date for Wednesday, July 29th for another noon lunch and learn uh, for us to do that. So let me just jump into Q&A and, and chat and see if we have uh, any um, consensus. All right. All right, we got, we, got a, we got a good batch of folks that would like to do some seed starting. So what we will do is we will work together offline after class and get all the details and get another webinar license and get a uh, Zoom link and we'll start marketing. So make sure that you um, keep an eye on your inbox for when we get that one going. Great, that's exciting. So. Here are some of the normal things that we have to think about when we talk about fall plantings. And some of these are different, right? So for example, I have a picture in the top right corner of my container garden. And my container garden is um, how I grow at my house because I have deep shade under walnuts, maples, and hackberries. And right now my containers are moved all the way out to the edge of my driveway. 
But when your leaves start to fall, you might find that you get a lot more sun available in October or November. So take advantage of that extra sun. And then I have soil health, organic matter, and fertility. Generally, when I'm growing in the fall, it's in a spot that I've been growing in all year already. And depending on what I've been growing and how much harvest and what that crop was, I have some serious concerns that I might have used up all the fertility and burned a bunch of that organic matter out. So a lot of times what you need to do is actually address that. You might need to refertilize, and by might, you probably will. I try to top off organic matter in my containers. I try to make sure that my fertility is going to get a harvest for all of my fall planted crops. I still have to mine crop rotation. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I do take advantage of my microclimates. So when it starts to get cooler in the fall and I want to scavenge a little heat at my house with my container garden, that works really good because I have black pots on black asphalt and that is a great batch of heat sink source. And then keep in mind pollinators. But one of the things I found about growing in the fall is when the weather is nice during the day, there's an abundance of pollinators who are still looking for that last batch of food that they can use to overwinter. But a lot of the ornamental plantings are winding down and there's not as much fall food. Uh, so I found that if I'm growing vegetables that are pollinator dependent, I get really good pollination and germination because of that um, overabundance of pollinators or at least a, a decent population of them. And my food uh, is right there ready for them to work on. My tool of choice that allows me to do a lot of the season extended into fall and, and, and into winter, which is a different class altogether, is, a, is called row cover. And row cover is a spun bonded fabric that's been around for a long time. It's used in a lot of um, different nursery and landscapes, as well as season extended plantings and traditional and urban farming. And, and it's, a, it's a fabric that is fairly inexpensive. It comes in multiple weights, meaning a very lightweight weight has uh, only a small amount of frost protection and lets the most sun through it, where a very heavy weight would have a lot of sun protection or, or would have a lot of frost protection and, and not as much sun penetration. But no matter what weight you have, they let water and they let air move through that, unlike say plastic. Um, I do incorporate plastic on occasion because plastic is elite at trapping um, as much heat as you can get in there, but it, it never rains under the plastic. So I try to do mostly row cover. Um, I try to be very gentle with it. I don't want to rip it. Uh, holes in it can be problematic in terms of how it's used. The nice thing about growing in the fall, when you need to do your season extended uh, row cover or in some cases if you don't have row cover and it's going to frost overnight you can use a tarp or you can use a blanket but generally we only need to do that overnight we don't need to protect as much during the day because while we do get some frosts we generally have decent uh, daytime temperatures and I'm growing cool season stuff for the most part. So this is a picture of uh, what would be a very lightweight row cover and you can see that it's not really dense. This is a great one if I wanted to protect some things like this radicchio or these lettuce mixes that are fairly cold tolerant. They just need a little frost protection overnight when we get a frost, but otherwise they're growing great during the day. And then this is what's known as frost blanket. And this is a double layer in the bottom picture. This is very heavy duty, lots of frost protection um, and lots of, of nice sort of temperature moderation. I use this when I'm doing season extended plantings where they need lots of protections like this spinach that is growing um, over winter. You can find these products all over the place. Every gardening catalog. I've actually seen these sold at Aldi. I've seen it sold at um, Tractor Supply and Harbor Freight. Uh, if you want, what I do is I buy it in large bulk rolls uh, off of uh, Amazon or another online seller. Um, you can cut it. Make sure that you just do your calculations for size very well. So like in this bottom picture, this is a four foot wide raised bed, but because it has the hoops on it, you need to make sure that you're getting something wide enough that will go all the way to the edge where it can be weighted down. You wouldn't get a four foot or even a five foot. I think this is probably 10 foot wide row cover. 
because of the bow, I need to have a little bit more width on it. And then here is where my container garden shines. So right now my container garden is in a very hot location on my driveway, right? And we had just a crazy amount of heat yesterday. It, it was just blistering in that space. I am a container gardener and I'm a community gardener. And and they don't antagonize each other, they play very well with each other. And this is what really allows me to have production for a long time period, because my community garden is only open between April 1st and November 1st. That coincides perfectly on the opposite side of the schedule with my container garden, which really shines starting in September all the way through of May with overwintered. So right now I do have a few very heat tolerant plants that are growing in my containers. Um, I do have mulch down to protect uh, and spare as much evaporative loss and try to keep that soil cool. But boy, they get really, really hot on a hot day and I worry about those plants. Using my microclimate and the fact that I get extra sunlight because my leaves fall from my deciduous trees. This is a wonderful place to plant where I will be able to get great harvest September, October, November, December, and even over winter plantings to harvest them in January, February, and March. So we do have to mind our crop rotation, right? Because we wanna make sure that since we're intensively planting and we're gonna be following and following and following that we are doing our best job. And I know we can't always do a perfect job, but we're doing our best job at trying not to grow things in the same spot each year. And I know that can be difficult. Um, but keep in mind that when we talk crop rotation, we're talking about vegetables within certain families. And if you look at this, you'll note tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, potatoes, those are all the same family. And like the brassicas are huge and the cucurbits are huge. I'll be very honest, I don't have a garden that is really easily facilitative of crop rotation because it is a giant space that gets plowed with a Ford tractor and a rototiller. So all the dirt from everybody's gardens get mixed up. I try to space my plantings to different parts of my garden so that I get as many benefits of crop rotation knowing I can't do it perfectly. And it can be difficult to do it perfectly. But what I will say that if I have to make choices, I really prioritize crop rotation on the big three family that get hit hard by diseases and get hit hard by bugs. And that's the Solanaceae or tomato family, the brassicas or the cabbage family, and the cucurbits, which is your winter squash, your summer squash, your vining fruits, um, and your cucumbers. Address your fertility. If I've been growing, whether it's in ground or whether it's in a container, and I harvest something that's been there a while, I know I'm probably going to have to top off some fertilizer. If it's going to be there for a bunch, I might put a slow release organic that's going to feed for a couple few months. If it's something that's going to be shorter, like say a lettuce or um, or like an Asian cabbage, I might just do a couple of water soluble um, feedings of it. I also note where I have been growing my green beans because I know that I'm going to have a little bit of extra fixed atmospheric nitrogen in there. So I try to follow my green beans with a planting that's going to be a heavy feeder of nitrogen and take advantage of that. All right, so here's a good natural break. I'm going to jump up in the chat box and see what we got. Hello, can you cover if we want to grow lettuce in the fall when to start seedlings? That is what we're doing right now. Perfect. Um, how do I attach the PVC to the bed? So what I do with the PVC is I uh, screw basically some uh, weather resistant, say three or four inch screws in there until I have a, an inch or two sticking out and that way the PVC can sleeve right over those screws. And for an, any vegetable recommendations, these are soon to start right now. You guys are full of outstanding questions and you are on top of it. Let's talk about what to plant and when. So my sort of target date that is a decision date is around August 1st. And that's not hard and fast for every vegetable, but I like to have a bunch of things started indoors around maybe a little before depending on a planning, maybe a little after depending on a planning, August 1st. And here's what I mean by that. I'm gonna start lettuce indoors around August 1st. 
I'm going to start my kale indoors and all my other brassicas, uh, cabbage family or the cucumber family indoors around August 1st because you're going to get germination in about a week. You're going to get them to first true leaf, maybe another week after that. They're going to be ready for maybe a transplant in about four to six weeks, which puts them outside in September when the weather is hopefully thinking about cooling down because these in some cases, especially cabbage family or a lot of the lettuces or kale or things like that, they like the cool weather. Now, the cucurbits that I'm planting are the fast ones. And so when you see me have cabbage family, the fast ones, or cucurbits, the fast ones, I'm talking about ones that mature quickly. For example, I'm not planting Brussels sprouts out at that time because Brussels sprouts take all season to mature. And when I'm making my choices, I'm picking one of the faster maturing varieties of say a head cabbage or a cauliflower, or in terms of the cucurbits, I'm not planting say a Waltham butternut or a watermelon around August 1st because they just take too long. I'm looking at those 55, 52 day varieties, you know, your, your yellow uh, summer squash or zucchini or maybe some cucumbers that are fast matures. When I start them August 1st, they're getting ready to transplant about six weeks later. That gets them outside, say early September. They're going to, at 55 days from direct seed, they're going to be producing around the beginning of October meaning I need to do a little season extension to prevent frosts occasionally because our first frost dates around October 15th and I will throw a cover over it just to do frost protection and let them grow throughout the day and that generally gets me good production of a lot of these veg in October even November I'm eating fresh veg I grew myself around Thanksgiving when to plant direct seeded, I try to stick pretty close to that August 1st one with a little bit of some caveats, meaning I will plant green beans outside of my garden, my last planting of green beans, and I plant sequential green beans, you know, every two, three, four weeks the entire season. I have three different green bean plantings in my garden right now in terms of timing. I try to get my last planting of green beans in around August 1st outside first week of August, we'll say. And I'm watching the weather predictions because I like to use them to my advantage. Again, you're making your wise varietal choices. I'm planting a quick bush bean. I'm not putting in a long bush bean. I'm not putting in a pole bush bean. I'm putting something in that if I direct seed it August 1st and it's going to be producing at 48 or 55 days, I'm starting to eat fresh green beans by August or by October 1st. And, and then I get a harvest fairly reliably for a few weeks after that. Uh, same thing. I do a lot of direct seeding of like my cucurbits indoors. That is more a result of my garden. If you have some nice fluffy good tilled soil that has great germination, you can do that out in your garden. My garden is river bottom clay that in August 1st is probably dried to concrete and I would have very terrible germination. So I do kind of pre-sprout and pre-plant um, a few different plants. Uh, to get them to at least first seed or first true leaf after seeding like a zucchini or a yellow squash, if that makes sense. And then if you look at my listing on the right side, radish to spinach, lettuce, I'm not starting them outside August 1st. I might start them inside in terms of the lettuce, but I'm waiting till we get closer to Labor Day for things like radishes or spinach because they will just burn up in that heat and I don't want them to do that. Other things, great carrots, green onions, you could do beets again, Swiss chard, cucurbits, green beans, we talked about that. I don't have on the list peas, um, but you could do peas. I would probably do either English peas or a bush um, snap pea. You know, like a, a sugar snap pea is going to get four or five, six feet tall. Baby peas are pretty cold resistant. Adult pea plants are not. So I would go with something more like a sugar and variety but again, you're reading your package label. You're trying to find something that matures really fast. If you are planting a late season planting of what other would wise be called a traditional summer planting. But I do this every year and I get great production. Don't be afraid to try another 
last ditch planting of things like your zucchini and your cucumbers and your green beans and some things that, that are fast maturing summer vegetables because you can get a harvest at the end of the season. One of the things I like about it is that goes very well against some of the life cycles of some of these really bad bugs. So one of the things that I noticed in my garden, and maybe you noticed it in yours, was a couple weekends ago, uh, it was after our six inch rain, when then after that six inch rain, we went into the 90s. If you remember that weather, it rained a ton and then it just baked for days. There was a mass emergence of striped cucumber beetles at my garden. All of the overwintered adults had kind of waited. We had had a lot of cold weather. We got all that rain. And then once the heat came out, I've, I've never seen this phenomenon in my garden. The life cycle of this predator is they emerge from their organic matter sort of hiding places where they've been all winter. The adults then find plants in the cucurbit family. They start chewing on them to get a meal. Then they lay eggs at the base of the plant. Those babies are going to hatch, start chewing on the plants, and turn into adults. I've never seen them all come at once. We had thousands in my garden. They were flying around everywhere. It was unbelievable. And that caught a lot of gardeners um, basically unawares because it's one thing if you have a little bit of feeding damage. It's another thing when there's thousands of predators released instantaneously. And in my garden, it, it, it was devastating to various plantings if you did not have some sort of protection, whether it was row cover or a pesticide. Uh, this was a plant that was just getting chewed very early in the day. This plant had been left out overnight. The gardener had brought it down. It was a beautiful, healthy plant with no damage. And when she came and she left it in the plot, going to plant it the next morning. And when she got to the garden, it had been completely chewed to bits. And this is, um, this is a phenomenon that happens every year, but I've never seen it spike to this level. What does that mean for you if you do an over or an, uh, a fall planting? Here's an example of a yellow squash plant. I started this the first week of August a couple years ago. I took this picture October 11th and look at how beautiful that plant looks because the cucumber beetles and things like flea beetles and things like a lot of the predators at that point they're completing their life cycle. They're leaving to find their overwintered homes and so if you have had real problems keeping a lot of your summer squash or your cucumbers alive from cucumber beetle damage. I have found a much higher level of success with that last planting to get a harvest. You do have to mind your pollinators, right? So if you throw some row cover over this, you need to remove it to allow pollination to occur. Um, and, and, and keep in mind, you know, that mid-October, and that's right when we're getting great harvest based on our timing of our planting, right? that is one where we will have frost because that is when average frost dates start. So use your sequential planting. Um, make sure you, you have lots of stuff coming out. I will start lettuce uh, under the lights August 1st and then probably do a six or a 12 pack um, every two weeks after that where I am hopeful of eating fresh lettuce out of my garden all the way uh, to Thanksgiving and maybe even serve a salad for Thanksgiving dinner. So cover crops is something I, I talked about just for a second and we're going to spend just a couple minutes on it, but it, it's a topic that deserves uh, its own class of at least an hour. In fact, I, I teach this as a guest lecture for horticulture and crop science and, and this class can go fairly, fairly long. So this is more of a get your brain kind of thinking about something as opposed to go in depth. But what a cover crop is, is it is another one of those tools in your toolkit like mulch or like crop rotation or like, um, you know, row cover. It is where you intentionally plant a certain variety or mix of varieties. These are usually related to some sort of agronomic crop like a soybean or a you know, corn family or wheat, cereal grains and things that do beneficial things in your garden and keep a planted 
planting in that space so you have living roots, so you minimize erosion, so you're, so you're building organic matter and not decreasing organic matter. All cover crops do one, two, maybe three things. None of them do everything, but there are cover crops out there that are good at suppressing weeds. There are great cover crops out there that will burst through hard pan and, and, and break subsoil up or build up biomass or fix nitrogen, things like that. As we get into fall, uh, I like to try to make sure that there's some kind of organic matter going on in my garden. It used to be that after they bush hogged November 1st, it would then rototill and they would leave bare soil until the next year. And I've convinced them to not do that. I want to not have bare soil where I'm going to have a leaching out of all of my organic matter or fertility. And, you know, if there's weed seeds, in, and they don't incorporate them in the soil, uh, the hope would be that birds and small mammals will vacuum some of those up so we have less problems in there. There's a couple different um, sort of mixes that I use. Depending on your management, uh, the crops that are listed in the overwintered mix that are harder to manage, forage radishes, which is basically like a daikon radish, or vetch, or crimson clover, or winter rye, these are all very, very cold hardy plantings. And so you can plant them e either as an individual plant or you can find mixes of all of them. And this will germinate and grow and it will not die over the winter. And then spring shows up and this stuff starts to grow like crazy. It can be difficult to manage. You, you might need more than a mower. You might need a metal bladed weed whacker. So this is something that I plant because I have the ability to manage it. If you don't, uh, a great blend is oats and Austrian winter peas. These are both cold tolerant, but not necessarily cold hardy. And if we have a normal winter, these actually will die in the middle of that normal winter from too much cold, which means you don't have to manage them, meaning you don't have to chop them down or, or mix them up. Uh, if, we, if you wanna learn more about cover crops, contact me um, offline at my email and I can, uh, address any questions you might have about that. I generally try to have that hardy blend planted in at least most of my community garden plot before the season ends so that I get some good growth over the winter and that gets incorporated in the spring and I have more organic matter and a healthier plot as a result. So questions, I'm gonna leave this up so you have my email and I'm gonna jump into the chat box right now. So feel free to start throwing questions my way. And keep in mind this, if you submitted questions ahead of time, I filled those out and I send that over to Casey who works with Tracy and Jane and they're going to be uploaded. So those questions are all uploaded as well. So let's go back here, let's see. We talked about when do I direct seed my fall seeds? Uh, if so, would I start my greens on August 1st? Um, I would start maybe kale or collards outside August 1st so that they mature in the cool weather. But, but be careful, be guided by the predictions. You, you really don't want to eat a green that matures in smoke and heat. Would you plant the fall vegetables in the same spot as the summer vegetables? I would plant fall vegetables in the same spot as summer vegetables. I would mine crop rotation at that time. I would not plant green beans in the same spot that I had green beans because you already have too much nitrogen in that soil. You're gonna get leafy green beans without beans. I would not follow the brassica or the cucurbit family in the same spot as the brassica or cucurbit family for my summer planting into fall because those have bad pests, weeds, and diseases. So I would probably, after my green beans, I would probably plant something that's going to take advantage of that nitrogen, um, like, like leafy greens. And if I had something that was in the space, like a heavy feeder, like maybe my broccoli or cauliflower, uh, I would put green beans in that space to start building um, soil nitrogen back up. And here's a question. I have a new 30 foot raised bed that I'm using the Hugo culture method to fill the beds. What would do best in a newly developed raised bed with Hugo culture buildup? One year age logs. Um, what I would make sure that I would do is I would plant something in there. Uh, you know, it, it really depends what time of year. What I tell folks is get something in, the, in that Hugo culture bed to stabilize that soil very, very well because 
the you know we get these flash rains like we're supposed to get a thunderstorm later today um we had the other day if you, it was hit or miss depending on where you were are in columbus um i got and and i was at waterman farm and they got the same rain because i live close to campus we got an inch of rain in 16 minutes and if your hugel culture bed does not have a good root mass holding that soil on top of it it's going to get washed off so seasonally dependent right right now you want to throw something in there that's going to tolerate summer just get something planted in it so you get root growth so that you hold that soil and i had an infestation of them a few years in my chrysanthemums yeah cucumber beetles um, will eat a bunch what deters japanese beetles um, not much deters them they're pretty tough they are going to go for a lot of different things what i do is i do good scouting because i want to catch them as early as i can so when you have a lot of these beetles you you want to start early with your scouting so that you can kill them as as fast as you can early in the season before they start to breed and start to replicate themselves because they lay lots of eggs one of the things that i have noticed in my garden is that there is a very common weed that's called pennsylvania smart weed um, that grows probably in everybody's garden in central ohio but that is the preferred food for Japanese beetles. They like that more than they even like my vegetables. So I keep a little patch of that alive so that I can let the beetles feed on it and I can kill them on that and not have to do anything on my vegetables. But you have to make sure you kill them if you leave a, what's known as a trap crop uh, on there because if you don't, then you just fed them and you um, got that in. Uh, uh, probably even made it worse. Do you turn cover crops over and when? It, it depends on the cover crop. Um, that is a, a, a difficult question. There's well over 100 cover crops. All of them have their own management and your decisions on how to manage are based on the species that you pick. So that is not one that you, it's easy to um, to address. I'll give you an example. Right now in my garden, several of the gardeners decided that they weren't going to work their plots for various reasons, but they wanted to maintain soil health and they want to build up fertility and they want to make sure that they're making their plot better for next year and not worse. So a good summer, easy to manage variety of cover crop is buckwheat. If buckwheat is managed inappropriately, it becomes a very bad weed. It's in the knotweed family. Buckwheat has germinated down at my community garden and it is starting to flower. It does a great job with flowering. It attracts tons of pollinators. It needs to be mowed before the flowers get pollinated and set seed. Um, and that is about five to six weeks after. That's individual to that planting. Is there a summary table or website that indicates when to plant and types or longevity of plants that won't work for a late planting? There probably is. Um, I don't know of one offhand. What I will tell you guys this, you know, when you do searches on the internet, it can be really, really frustrating because you'll pull up a million different things and you don't know what is accurate or what is not. Whenever I do a search in the internet, I always make sure that I type the word extension at the end. So if I was doing like planting fall vegetables, if I just type that in the into Google, I'm going to get a lot of stuff in there that is not probably either accurate or appropriate for me to use. If I put planting fall vegetables extension, that is going to only bring up research-based publications from land-grant universities and you can pick according to where it is. Maybe it's from Ohio State, maybe we don't have one, but you can pick one from say Michigan State or you can pick one from a you know Penn State or a state that is very close to us in terms of climate. Question is off topic, but how can I prevent milkweed aphids? Um, that's very difficult to do because right milkweed you plant as a pollinator plant and you are attracting um, basically butterflies monarchs in order to do that my recommendation would be a, a mechanical removal and the nice thing about aphids is you can actually spray them off with a hose to wash them off the plant so that's what i would control milkweed aphids with
Do I recommend oats and winter peas for raised beds? I, yeah, sure. I've planted uh, oats and, and winter peas in raised beds. Here's the one difference, and I'm going to go back in my slide deck here for a second while we're looking at it. The overwintered mix you can plant that fairly late in the season. In fact, I've planted that as, as late as mid-November. It's probably best planted around October 1st. The easy to manage one, it's best planting date in order to get the most impact out of that planting is actually closer to August 1st. So you have some trade-offs. Because this is less cold tolerant, the easy one has to be planted early in order for you to get enough growth to make it actually worth your while. Whereas the late planted one, you can go much later. Uh, do herbs do well in the fall? Some do. Um, most of the perennial ones don't care. I mean, I'm going to be harvesting sage and oregano and I'm gonna be harvesting, um, you know, uh, parsley and, and maybe even a little more chive growth. Those are all cold tolerant. Basil does okay, but basil is not cold tolerant. Uh, cilantro does better than basil. Cilantro has a little bit of cold tolerance. So it really depends on how well they do and what kind of protection they can give. But that would be the same answer for any other vegetable or um, uh, any other vegetable or fruit. How should I clean my gardening tools to prevent disease transmission between my community and home garden plots? You would first make sure you scrub off all the organic matter and then you could use like a light bleach dip. The, the key though is you have to have the organic matter off because most organic matters, if you leave a bunch of dirt or residue or compost or whatever on there, um, disinfectants are, don't work on it. So you um, get that uh, removed and then any disinfectant bleach solution, you know, pine salt doesn't matter to me. However, you would clean something like that the same as you would clean uh, and disinfect any other tool. Where would you suggest to purchase seeds, spinach and others? You can still find seeds um, at any of the gardening stores, although they've been pretty picked over right now. You can find seeds from any number of online sources. They're starting to unbury themselves from the uh, avalanche of interest in gardening. Uh, so all the traditional sources you can still find. Is there such a thing as winter cover crop in central Ohio? Yes, Bill, I live in central Ohio and I, uh, there's, there's lots of choices. All the ones that we already talked about are ones that I grew, those pictures I took myself and all of those were grown in central Ohio. And why are my spinach leaves turning yellow? Um, if it's the oldest leaves at the bottom of the plant turning yellow, uh, you are deficient in nitrogen. How do I control flea beetles on tomatoes? Flea beetles have been horrible this year. This is the worst flea beetle year that I have ever encountered. Um, I have had flea beetles in numbers that I've never encountered before and they've eaten way more than they used to. It used to be that I would have problems with flea beetles on my um, arugula and on my eggplant and about nothing else. And, and they actually did damage my tomatoes, uh, radishes, turnips, all of those things. So the, the key is, is you treat when you need to treat and you don't when you don't. Meaning that I treated my tomatoes and, and, and basically there's any number of different pesticides that are labeled for use. There's some that are organic and some that are not. You read the label and you make sure that you read, understand and follow that label because the label is the law. But if I, if I know that the plant is going to tolerate a light amount of damage, especially when I have flowers coming out, I do not use that any pesticide. I, I would let those uh, things do that. Would you suggest treating any vegetable fruit plants with neem oil? Is it safe to consume after treatment? Uh, you would follow the label, right? It's the same thing, guys. Any, it's all written on there and there's withdrawals, meaning there is an interval on the label of all pesticides for every different vegetable variety. And you need to make sure that that label says it's appropriate for that pest. And there's a thousand different labels, so I don't know them all. So you become a label reader a little bit. Can both be controlled with neem? Different preparations of neem would be labeled for bean leaf beetle or for flea beetle. And if you wanted to, you would make sure that you purchased one that has that label that works for those. And then depending on what you spray it on, you need to make sure you mind your pollinators because you don't want to kill the pollinators. And then you look at that label and find out what is the time period after application of a pesticide that I before I can safely ingest that food. 
In succession planning, is there anything that should not follow radishes? Radishes are in the brassica family. So that would be any of the other brassicas. Is planting seeds indoors near a window? Unfortunately, I've not found good success with that because um, even a south face window really only has a short time frame where you get great sun. And especially when seeds are babies, they need great sun. Uh, what makes tomato leaves curl up? Tomato leaf curl can be insects. It can be uh, heat related as well. Um, I wouldn't, if you've already adequately fertilized them, I wouldn't necessarily throw more fertilizer on. I don't fertilize my plants that are stressed unless I know it, the stress is from a nutrient deficiency. Uh, I recommend that you would do a soil test to make sure that you have enough um, enough fertility for that. So I think that um, that you guys will find the seed starting class very helpful. I don't use sunny sills. Um, I use grow lights and then I set them for a 15 hour timer because when you are starting your own seeds you need to mimic the sun, full bore sun. And while you can get that success with a sunny windowsill, if you have a full day of sun on that sunny windowsill, I've had way too many people report failures than successes trying to grow um, that way. And so uh, for the zucchini question, very similar to the spinach question. If the zucchini transplant leaves are turning yellow and it's not disease, because disease can cause a yellowing as well, but yellowing of plant leaves that are the oldest leaves, the most common cause of that would be a nitrogen deficiency. Um, they would need fertilized. Good questions, gang. You guys are full of good questions today. We still have a couple minutes for a couple more questions if you want to throw them in there. What is a good way to add nitrogen now to my spinach? You would want to use a water soluble fertilizer. Uh, you can use organic or non-organic. I'm talking about something that you mix in water in the watering can because you need a fast acting fertilizer and water soluble is fast. And that way when you water, you're delivering that fertilizer all the way down to the roots immediately. So I wouldn't use like a granular fertilizer to address a nutrient deficiency. I'm gonna use a fast acting fertilizer, which means a water soluble one. We got three in the QA. Okay. Uh, there's one in the QA that was not in the chat. How can I keep my cauliflower from turning purple? So um, assuming it's not a purple variety, because there actually is a purple cauliflower variety, generally color change like that in cauliflower um, means that they're getting too much heat and too much sun. Believe it or not, um, cauliflower when if you want it the white to stay the whitest that it needs to be it needs to be protected from a lot of sunlight on the white part um, and once the heat comes um, I found my cauliflower started turning uh, that same color so too much sun and too much heat they they in the industry they like to blanch that and and um, I've seen where people will actually take the cauliflower leaves and they'll loosely sort of bunch them over the head of cauliflower to keep too much sun off of it so that it stays that nice desired white color. All right. Oh, we got a whole bunch more questions. Okay. How can I keep my thyme and mint from getting leggy? Um, you can do that by pruning and you prune back to where you know you have growth, um, where you're gonna have like a, a junction where the leaves are for both your mint and your thyme. What are some specifications for the grow lights? You would just want to make sure that it's listed as a grow light to grow plants because there are a number of different lights that are out there. There's thousands of them. Um, the specifications would be that it is designed to um, provide light for growing plants. 
Uh, I tried to grow beets and the leaves look great, but there isn't a bulb. We grew from seed March 31st. So there's two very common reasons why you might not have bulbs for beets. And this holds true as well for radishes is one, if there's too much nitrogen in the soil, they will grow great looking leaves. Um, but an overabundance of nitrogen means that they won't actually form that, that root bulb. They'll just do leaves. The other thing that causes them to not form a big bulb is if they are spaced too closely. Closely, After you plant your seeds, um, I send mine to at least every three inches for beets and radishes, which seems like a pretty far distance, but if they're crowded, they will not form that desired par, uh, port. Is 2020-20 fertilizer good for summer and fall plants? Maybe. Fertilization should be um, accompanied by a soil test because you don't know uh, if that is enough or if that is too much. Um, and, and fertilizer is a funny thing because 20-20-20 means 20% nitrogen, 20% phosphorus, 20% potassium. So is that good for summer or fall plants? There's so many forms that it can come in. Is that a slow release granular fertilizer? Um, then, and, and do you need fertilizer in that spot? Then that's probably a good one. If I was say growing green beans in there, uh, I wouldn't necessarily fertilize with a lot of nitrogen because I just like with the example with the beets or the radishes, I don't want that much leaf growth. I want the edible portion of it. So th the question is maybe. Um, fertilizer is a really tricky thing because it's not simple. Um, it comes in so many different forms and the numbers can make it difficult to evaluate uh, because the 2020 fertilizer might not be complete or it might be complete. I know I'm not making a ton of sense, but fertilizer is probably good for its own class as well. Um, I recommend that what you do is you soil test every three years or so, and that way your, your fertilizer choice is guided by exactly what you need to put in based on what's already in your soil and what your desired plantings off. So if you snap the main leader off your tomato plant, will it continue to grow and produce fruit? Probably. What you would then do is you would encourage um, the next largest sucker that is um, growing. A sucker is a stem growth that occurs at the junction of a branch and the main stem. And then you train that to become your new main leader and you can get production off that. So next question, what type of soil do you use in your pots? I um, my pots are about two thirds compost for my compost pile. And then I use some bagged, you know, you can buy bagged compost or bagged um, um, composted manure, bagged humus, things like that. Uh, if I have to fill lots of those, I would maybe get a bulk soil delivery of a compost product, something like that. So I'm gonna type into the chat room. We sell um, soil tests out of our office where we buy them um, from Penn State so that people can come in and just get them. But our office is closed until at least July 7th, which is our first day in. So I just typed in the name of a company called Spectrum Analytic. Spectrum Analytic is an Ohio-based company. They're down in Washington Courthouse. And if you go on their website, uh, they will give you instructions on how to get a soil test and, and send that in. They're a great company. I've worked with them in the past. Um, it's inexpensive. It's like $12 for a test. Uh, and, and the website will also give you instructions on how to harvest that soil and prepare it. And then you just print off a label and you put it in a bag and put that bag in a little envelope or box and mail that soil sample in. And then they get the result back and they send you the results. And then if you have any questions about that at all, you contact me and I will be delighted to assist you interpret those. Yeah, so we have done some great sessions already where we talked a lot about organic matter and we talked about raised beds and we talked about containers and, and all of those things. And so if you need a little bit of uh, some background information or refresher on that, the, um, the previous workshop sessions can be found there. I'm gonna stop share and I'm gonna pull up um, a share of the website that I maintain, 
for OSU Extension Franklin County, which is called Growing Franklin. If I can figure out where that is um, on my computer. No, it's not that one. Where are you, buddy? There it is. So I maintain a website, um, Growing Franklin. Thank you so much, Jane. And on that is a whole bunch of different things. If you want to, um, to take a look at that, it, I put the classes that I host, I put informative articles on there, I archive all the webinars, there's instructional videos on there, a whole bunch of really cool stuff. And, um, and that is one that I recommend that you subscribe, which is this box right here, because when I add content, I try to put it in on campus or, or send it out through the various listservs that way, but subscribers get emails um, with updates when I add things instantaneously, and then you will have that information right off the bat. All right, thanks for the kind words, gang. Any last questions before we wrap up? Well, my pleasure. So, Tracy and Jane, thank you so much. We- um, thank you all. We will be working on a July 29th Lunch and Learn for seed starting to um, give you guys all of this needed information for starting your own seeds at home. You will find that it is a game changer when you can grow every single thing in that catalog. Alrighty, thank you all for attending today and we uh, look forward to you in July. Lock that date in and um... We, uh, thank you all for joining us today. And we'll uh, I, we will be sending out the, uh, the link to this recording um, sometime later this afternoon or tomorrow. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day and stay safe. All righty. Bye-bye.